So good morning. Uh, good morning. I want to welcome you to the breakfast session. Uh, this is going to be a session dedicated to techniques and tools in embolotherapy. And uh, this is going to be a, really a case-based symposium, which is sponsored and supported by uh, Medtronic. These are some of our disclosures. And really the objective here is we're going to be reviewing appropriate embolic agents to be utilized for various disease entities, and we'll be going through some of those in details. I wanted to introduce the panel. Uh, my name is Rupal Gandhi. I'm an interventional radiologist at Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute. Um, to my right is Dr. Camel uh, from UT, from University of Texas. We, then we have Dr. Bulan Arslan uh, from Rush. And then finally, Gloria Salazar uh, from uh, MGH. And topics we're going to be discussing include hypogastric aneurysm embolization, um, visceral, visceral artery aneurysm embolization, gastric varices therapy, and then f finally pelvic venous insufficiency. Um, so we, we're going to go ahead and launch into this. These are my disclosures. So this is a 64-year-old gentleman who was referred for management of a right common iliac artery aneurysm and a left hypogastric artery aneurysm. The patient really had no symptoms. He remained physically active and was sexually active as well. Past medical history is significant for prior thoracic aortic aneurysm, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes mellitus with medications as listed. And here's some uh, dedicated images uh, through the patient's abdomen and pelvis and one by one here, showing the right common iliac artery aneurysm here. And then we could see the left hypogastric aneurysm and the right common iliac artery aneurysm here on the same image. You can see that further going in. And here, here are some cine images showing the same thing. Here are some uh, 3D volume reconstruction images uh, demonstrating, again, um, you know, better relationship to the surrounding vessels, uh, the orientation of the right common iliac artery aneurysm, as well as the left hypogastric aneurysm. So let me, let me, let me go back here. So these are, can you go back one slide, please? Perfect. Actually, this, this slide is good. So in taking a look at this, you know, this patient has about a three centimeter right common iliac artery aneurysm and about a three centimeter left hypogastric artery aneurysm. And you know, maybe I'll just kind of open it up. Uh, Bulan, uh, you know, what, what are you utilizing as your threshold for treatment of you know, these types of aneurysms? Yeah, for, for the common iliac, three centimeters kind of the, uh, when you start considering treatment, you know, depending on the patient, obviously. Uh, age and how you're going to treat the complexity of the treatment. That's, those are all factors. For the hypogastric, I don't think there's a criteria, but uh, I look at the size of the original vessel, depending on if it's fusiform, saccular, et cetera, and even a smaller aneurysm should be treated, like a splenic, for example, this time we start thinking about treatment at two, two and a half. And uh, saccular aneurysms especially worry me a lot more than the fusiform aneurysms. So it's going to be a discussion with the patient and, uh, and then looking at the complexity, making up a decision together. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, I mean, so those are certainly some of the things that, you know, we, we thought about as well. You know, you know, typically our, you know, threshold has been about three centimeters for common iliac artery aneurysm, although I have to tell you, you know, with some of the data, you know, we've kind of been pushing that up a little bit, you know, even the three and a half or four centimeters. I don't know what the best number is, but certainly, you know, I think we could be a little bit more conservative there. Um, with the hypogastric aneurysm, we've been, we've been typically utilizing about a three centimeter threshold, you know. Again, not a lot of strong data here, but, you know, I think that's kind of been the general consensus. So in this case, what we chose to do was really to stage him. Thought we would go ahead and watch the right common iliac artery aneurysm since it was, you know, just around that threshold. Um, but we were, you know, more concerned about that left hypogastric artery aneurysm. And as you said, you know, looking at the uh, diameter of that with respect to the normal vessel, you know, when we did measure that, it was about 250%. Um, a little bit larger than that. So in, you know, treatment options here, you know, there's obviously various different <coughs> options here. Um, Dr. Camel, uh, you know, if you're treating, let's t talk about that hypogastric artery aneurysm. You have an, you know, a best way of treating it. Um, for this, I think, you know, if they're saccular, uh, like this case, you know, probably will have to go distal to this just to close the back door and then, um, you know, with coils and then maybe make our way back to, uh, the aneurysm sac itself, coil it, um, 
sometimes, you know, uh, when it's like large enough, you know, and, um, you know, we're going to use a lot of coils for that. We sometimes augment that with uh, some other embolics like um, thrombin or so, and then we coil the, uh, the, the artery itself, like the, the feeding artery. So, um, yeah, it's, um, that's how we usually do it. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of different treatment yeah. options here. I think it, you know, really depends on the actual anatomy. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, it probably also matters, you know, what devices you might have, you know, with you, within your inventory. You know, this, this is, a, you know, a kind of good review paper from uh, CVIR a few years ago, which looked at, you know, these different hypogastric aneurysms. And basically what they really looked at was what is the diameter um, of the inflow vessel and what is the length of the inflow vessel to determine whether you need to, whether you have adequate distance just to embolize that or whether you actually need to place, you know, a covered stent uh, as well. And, you know, again, it's very dependent on the anatomy. So in this case, um, a patient had, you know, very tortuous anatomy, as you can see here. Uh, certainly options would, you know, going up and over what we th thought was going to be a little bit challenging. Considered a radial approach as well, certainly feasible, um, but decided to utilize an ipsilateral, ipsilateral approach here. Uh, we were, you know, actually, you know, kind of experimenting with this robotic catheter. So we utilized this robotic catheter to select the left hypogastric artery. And um, the left hypogastric artery was then uh, catheterized here. So, uh, Gloria, taking a look at this um, this angiogram here, you know what would you know Dr. Campbell mentioned? You know, obviously various different approaches, but now you know looking at the actual anatomy here, you know how would you treat it? I mean, obviously, you know if we were to you know have a discussion amongst the panel, I'm sure we would all treat it in a little, little bit differently. Uh, you know, I don't think there's a right or wrong, but do, what, what's your approach? I mean, really with those cases, like when, if you're in the elective setting, um, you want to preserve the parent vessel. In this situation, you, you definitely, I mean, it's, it's a challenging case with the tortuosity of the iliacs. So you want to secure your axis like you did and perhaps consider um, preserving the main vessel and just trying to do like a stent assisted coil embolization. Unfortunately, it, it, it's not that uncommon, at least in our practice. We want to just coil the aneurysm and have a, you know, a sort of a small neck. But that's not usually the case when patients with uh, aneurysms like that present. It's, it's very challenging. That's an option. In, and if you're in an emergency setting, I think, you know, you know, if you end up rupturing or whatever, then you, you just coil everything. I mean, that's a, it's a, it's a it's sort of a, you have to save the patient. But in elective settings, I think we would like to preserve the, um, the flow. Yeah, you know, this, this gentleman, you know, although, although on the older side he was, um, he still remained both physically active and sexually active. So, you know, I think definitely in the last few years, we've, you know, I think in the past we used to be a little bit more nonchalant about, you know, just shutting down the vessels. But, you know, we definitely try to make an attempt at preservation if we can. You know, whether, you know, preserving one of the branches, whether utilizing iliac branch devices, et cetera. And also, you have the other you're observing right now. Absolutely. And you don't know how you're going to treat that one yet. 100%, 100%, because that could end up, you know, depending on the landing zone, having to sacrifice that. So in this case, you know, we really looked at this and, you know, the, looking at kind of the anterior division, the posterior division, and really the, we looked at the, you know, there's more of a mismatch between the anterior division versus the posterior division. So in this, in this case, it decided to embolize the anterior division there to shut down the flow with the goal to actually maintain patency to the posterior division of the uh, left hypogastric artery here. So uh, this is a subsequent angiogram here. So that, that is now shut down. Um, and, and then, you know, obviously different approaches here. Um, you know, one thing that we certainly considered was placement of a covered stent here. Um, as another option, uh, as Dr. Salazar mentioned, is, you know, stent-assisted coiling. And then, obviously, the final option would be, you know, to shut down the shut down the entire thing, which you know was something that we're trying to avoid in this patient. Um, it, certainly, a covered stent would have been a, a good option, but with this robotic catheter that we were utilizing, we were a little bit um, constrained in terms of uh, the sheath size for, you know, specifically, you know, we're thinking about a viabond there. So, uh, decided to actually actually utilize a, a bare metal stent here. This is um, a Medtronic Complete SC. It's a self-expanding bare metal stent, uh, which was deployed into the posterior division here. And subsequently, a microcatheter was uh, then advanced to the, through the interstices of the stent, as you can see here. Uh, an angiogram was performed. And, and then, uh, you know, embolization was then performed. Um, 
you know, in terms of, you know, uh, embolization here, uh, Dr. Salazar, I know you have some experience with the new uh, Concerto VersaCoil. You know, any comments on, uh, you know, would, it, would this be a good option for utilizing uh, such a coil for such an aneurysm? Yes, uh, one of the features of Versa is that it can be utilized with microcatheter and also for French systems. So in this situation, because it's large aneurysm, you would minimize the amount of coils that you would need because there are long coils. Um, and I'm going to show like a case at the end um, where we use that for large vessel territory. And there's nice occlusion and packing. So you don't need to spend a lot of time in there. But also you can, uh, you know, do it, um, you know, sort of relatively fast in, in a way that, you know, you just kind of pack the whole thing and, and you're done. Um, so definitely minimizes the time of um, occlusion. Um, Dr. Camel, I mean, look, there's, there's a lot of different coils out there. I don't, there aren't really that many studies comparing the different coils. Mm. Uh, do you have a preference for a specific coil that you utilize here? Well, definitely, you know, you want to utilize a coil that is, uh, you know, for such a for such a, uh, a size of an aneurysm, you want something that has um, lots of fibers on it. Uh, the length is important also, you know, you want to uh, minimize the number of coils, especially if you're using detachable ones so that you can reduce the cost and be cost effective. So uh, coils with um, that come in uh, uh, long, uh, long coils, uh, lots of fibers, that would be probably the way to go. Perfect. So uh, anyway, you know, multiple coils were placed and, you know, question here, you know, there's clearly, you know, some space there, you know, would you place additional coils? You know, there's, you know, there's some studies which talk about, you know, you having a specific, you know, packing, you know, density ratio. Um, Dr. Arson, I mean, you know, in a case like this, would you, you know, would you, you know, basically embolize this until, you know, all, you know, you didn't see any empty space whatsoever? You know, what, what's your end point? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard. I mean, I, I think this may do it. I like to pack things as much as I can uh, initially, but this is a large volume, and you already diverted the flow through the stent, etc. And we're kind of inherently impatient people, as I are. <laughs> so, but that's probably good enough, but I, I personally would just kind of pack it as much as I could. Sure. And uh, probably a few additional, like those are the verses are 6 to 5 cm. They're pretty, uh, well, they have, each single one of them has pretty good volume in them, so you could continue to do that, potentially, yeah. or? Yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's obviously a lot of different coils out there, yeah. and I think there's definitely different approaches. I know, um, I mean, there are places just using multi-layered stents, you know, even without coiling, you know, and a lot, sometimes these aneurysms will shut down and preserve vessels. But in, in any case, uh, this patient, you know, uh, we, do, we do have some follow-up imaging which showed no residual filling of the aneurysm. And um, you know, and the patient you know did not have any complications from the procedure. And we continue continue to observe the right common iliac. So just a, you know, a quick overview: about 25 percent of patients who undergo unilateral hypogastric artery sacrifice will experience either blood claudication or sexual dysfunction. And you know, the problem is that 50 percent of these patients will have persistent symptoms. You know, so while a lot of the symptoms will go away, not in all the patients. And you know there are there are even studies that show that when you take out the hypogastric artery, some of these patients have an increased 30-day mortality, and um, and was shown to be independently associated with ischemic colitis and even spinal cord injury. So, look, I think there are cases where you cannot preserve the hypogastric artery, but if you can, I think it's something that you know we should try to do. And um, I will stop there, and I'm going to uh, hand off uh, to uh, Dr. Campbell, who's going to be presenting the next case. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, it's a great, uh, great conference. So uh, uh, these are my disclosures. So uh, the first case is a 39-year-old male patient with a history of uh, Hep C cirrhosis and liver transplant. The patient then developed a splenic artery pseudoaneurysm and splenic infarct, and then he went underwent a splenectomy and splenic artery pseudoaneurysm repair. However, you know, he presented later with large amount of intraoperative blood loss and persistent postoperative aneurysm filling uh, with suspected persistent bleeding from that pseudoaneurysm. So um, they consulted, uh, the transplant team consulted IR for this case. So uh, we looked at the images, of course, that pseudoaneurysm on axial imaging was still present. So we decided to do an angiogram for him and uh, potential or possible embolization. So this is the celiac angiogram, as you can see, and there is splenic artery is very tortuous. But then you see this pseudoaneurysm that is in the distal part of the spleen. And um, when we went in, we seeded the catheter slightly into the splenic artery. And here's another angiogram, and you can see 
the large pseudoaneurysm in the distal splenic artery, as well as some, you know, outflow um, that is also going um, beyond the splenic pseudoaneurysm. So um, we went in with a microcatheter into the um, uh, pseudoaneurysm itself. Uh, our intention was to block the uh, distal artery or the outflow artery of that pseudoaneurysm and then make our way backwards and try to coil and embolize the pseudoaneurysm and then uh, embolize the feeder itself, which is so, a splenic so, artery. So, so let me ask you there, um, uh, for, the patient had a splenectomy, no? He did, actually, uh, but I'm not sure, uh, you know, what exactly went wrong here, but uh, they also, in the operative report, they said that they did some repair, so I'm assuming that this is a new one uh, compared to the prior one. So um, maybe something wrong uh, went during the repair itself, so it wasn't really adequately repaired. And, and Dr. Arslan, I mean, look, I mean look at, looking at Dr. Campbell's microcatheter, you know, he, he obviously has some great skills and he has very tortuous anatomy, and, but in a setting like this, do you find that some coils you know, track better than others uh, when you're, you know, sometimes you don't have like, you know, two 360 degree turns. I know, my own experience, some coils don't, you know, all coils are not created equally. What, what's your experience? Definitely. I mean, there's like, uh, you need to kind of understand coils that you're using. Uh, every additional turn that you take and then the, the way that that coil structure is going to either allow you to get there or not, you're going to get stuck at some point. And with this tortuosity, et cetera, you have to be careful. I mean, you can get like small coils in there, right? Most of those will go, but if you want to get large coils to kind of uh, be effective and then like embolize this thing like distal, proximal, etc., you need to make sure the coils are going to be uh, steerable, trackable, and, and doing what you want to do. Great. So anyways, we uh, coiled the outflow artery, as you can see here, and here's an angiogram, you know, showing the aneurysm, and there's no outflow at this point. We went in and coiled the aneurysm sac itself, and, and another angiogram here showing the aneurysm sac itself is, is now thrombosed. Uh, I think in this case we used um, additional thrombin just to augment um, the, the coil embolization. And then um, backwards, we went backwards and coiled the inflow artery itself, which is a splenic artery. And this is the final angiogram. You can see that the whole thing is um, blocked now, and there's still you know, flow uh, through some of the pancreatic branches and uh, left gastric. So, um, sorry, can you go back one slide? So that was the first case. This is another case um, that I would like also to present, a um, 36-year-old man who presented with gunshot wound. Um, of course, I work in Houston. It's one of the biggest uh, trauma centers. So when someone comes with a gunshot wound, it's always like uh, right axilla, right chest wall, right back, right everywhere. So uh, anyway, we did a CT that showed a grade four laceration to the uh, segment six and uh, a large um, uh, subcapsular hematoma as well. So this is the actual imaging here showing large anterior subcapsular hematoma and a pseudoaneurysm that is in, as you can see, posteriorly in segment six. There's a coronal reconstructed images again showing the pseudoaneurysm. So we were consulted and we did an angiogram and you can see there's an aneurysm sac that is filling distally inside the liver uh, in segment six or six, seven, maybe. And um, we went further uh, with a microcatheter uh, to be able to also uh, treat this. So um, you can see here it's coming from a branch and there's no distal outflow artery. So you always have to find that or try to find that one in order to prevent any backdoor bleeding. So. Uh, especially in organs like the liver where there's a lot of collaterals. Anyway, we went into the aneurysm sac itself. We uh, placed uh, several sets of coils here, as you can see. We kept coiling and then, um, you know, just to increase the density of the coils, which is very important. And then here's the final angiogram. You still see some filling. And of course, for pseudo aneurysms, always try to not just coil the aneurysm itself because, you know, if you do that, probably the aneurysm is going to keep growing and then, you know, most of the time these coils will be floating in there. So you have to really block the uh, inflow artery, which is what we did in this case. As you can see, we called uh, uh, the supplying artery to the pseudoaneurysm. And again, this is the final angiogram that shows that um, uh, the artery and the aneurysm are completely thrombosed. So and that's the final angiogram from the aorta. In terms of using an intraarterial approach versus you know, a direct <coughs> percutaneous approach uh, to these aneurysms, do you have, you know, so, general kind of algorithm or guidelines that you utilize? Um, I don't think there is a particular thing. It's, it's mostly uh, based on the location, how, can, how easily you can get to it. 
uh, and also how comfortable you are with the percutaneous approach. Um, because again, with the percutaneous approach, you, you lose the fact that you can see the arteries going in and out. So uh, th that, that is something that you cannot easily uh, demonstrate unless you're doing it combinedly with ultrasound and uh, floral guidance. Uh, the other thing is, you know, you will lose also your ability to go in distal and proximal. So in a pseudo aneurysm, sometimes, you know, it works. Uh, sometimes it recanalizes again when you use the percutaneous approach. I think the intra arterial approach, uh, in my, uh, you know, in my opinion, you know, it's, um, um, it's more predictable, I would say. Excellent. Anyways, uh, for visceral artery aneurysm, just uh, uh, a quick, um, you know, um, a discussion here. Uh, visceral artery aneurysms, uh, they are, by definition, you know, coming from the celiac, superior mesenteric, or inferior mesenteric arteries or their branches. They're very rare entities, you know, 0.1 to 2% prevalence. Um, of course, we know the true aneurysms and pseudo aneurysms. The difference is that true is, uh, involves the three walls of the artery. Pseudo aneurysms involve the outer wall. And most common causes for true aneurysms is atherosclerosis and medial degeneration or dysplasia. For pseudo aneurysms is iatrogenic, especially that we do a lot of endoscopic and intervention procedures these days. So. Um, yeah, the most common causes or locations for true aneurysms is splenic artery, which is around 75% of the cases. Hepatic artery comes next, which is around 20% of the cases. Rupture ranges from 25 to 100%, depending on the size and location. Uh, for pseudo aneurysms, of course, you know, uh, they're mostly um, uh, either in the splenic artery or the hepatic artery again. Splenic artery is usually in the setting of pancreatitis. Hepatic artery usually in the setting of uh, biliary interventions. Um, most of them were ruptured, so all of them you really have to be repaired. Uh, for splenic artery aneurysms, like we said, it's, it's the most common one. Uh, rate of rupture is around, uh, you know, 3 to 20 percent, depends where you read. Uh, true aneurysms occur, occur most commonly in multiparous females and portal hypertension. False aneurysms, as we said, in pancreatitis. Uh, hepatic artery aneurysms, less common. Uh, for the true, true hepatic aneurysms, as opposed to the splenic ones, they actually occur more commonly in men. Uh, rates of ruptures, again, you know, 80%, uh, mortality is around 20%. Increased risk of rupture is multiple aneurysms and non-atherosclerotic etiology. They have a high risk of rupture for hepatic uh, aneurysms. Uh, of course, the pseudo aneurysms, you know, with the increased uh, rate of interventions in the liver in terms of PTC and otherwise, you know, we're seeing more of these these days. Um, guidelines in general for intervention for true aneurysms if the patient is symptomatic. Uh, if it's a woman of childbearing age, patients who may require liver transplant, non-atherosclerotic etiology, as we said, like connective tissue disease, or if there is interval growth of more than 0.5 centimeter per year, um, if there's also multiple hepatic visceral artery aneurysms, or if you have a hepatic, splenic, or celiac aneurysm that is more than two centimeters, which is what Bullent was talking about, or any size uh, in a rare entity which is not hepatic, splenic, or celiac then we consider that a rare entity, so we don't really have much literature on it, so we treat all of them. For pseudoaneurysms, as I said, you know, there's a lot of uh, incidence of rupture for those. They don't have enough wall, so all of them should be treated. And with that, I'm going to end my talk here. So thank you so much again for the invitation. So uh, you know, before we move on to uh, a very nice talk uh, and very thank nice you. cases, uh, before we move on to uh, Dr. Arslan's cases, um, let me ask you, you know, what, you know, you mentioned, you know, some size thresholds for treatment of uh, visceral aneurysm. And interestingly, SVS got, you know, basically put out some recent guidelines uh, about a year ago. And they put their threshold for treatment for renal and splenic aneurysms to be three centimeters, mm -hmm. which, um, which is much larger than I could tell you that we're utilizing in our own practice. I'm, you know, I'm curious, are you utilizing the two centimeter threshold that, you know, that you mentioned there? Yeah, I think we're still more conservative on, uh, at two centimeters, especially if you have um, multi, uh, more than one risk factor. Like for example, it's a female multi paris at two centimeter, I would definitely treat that. Uh, if it just, you know, if, it, if it's only two centimeter, there's no other, you know, risk factors for, for treatment. Um, you know, you can be conservative. The usually, again, if it's a true aneurysm, if it's a pseudo aneurysm, it doesn't matter. I mean, you just have to treat them. Okay. And honestly, with the um, capabilities that we have right now, it's better just to treat them, uh, regardless of the, you know, uh, the, whether you use two or three, you know, the difference is not that much, you know, but, uh, you know, we have, it's easy to treat those, so I would just go ahead and treat them. Dr. Salazar, I, I, I think that is great that we have the guidelines, but you also have to consider the patient. Um, you know, and these reports are going out with, particularly with incidental findings. 
you know, the patients do really get very nervous of, of knowing that they have an aneurysm. So I, my approach is two centimeters, particularly in women. Um, the issue then becomes the follow-up, how often and how long you follow them up. But I think there's two things. I think that the patient perspective and then, you know, um, whatever the guidelines say. But, you know, two to three, I think it's reasonable to treat. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think those guidelines look, are based on not a lot of strong data because there isn't a lot of strong data. And our approach, I think, is very similar to you know, all your approaches. Like the mortality, the morbidity and potential mortality of a ruptured aneurysm is pretty significant if we could treat it safely. We, we're utilizing a two centimeter threshold. Same thing for you, uh, Dr. Ars. Yeah, I mean, same thing. And one thing that is important is I had a run of these lately. Uh, childbearing age is uh, crucial in these patients, and then you do have these patients. We had one case that patient was pregnant, I think uh, at nine weeks, and then came with a ruptured splenic artery aneurysm. That was only one and a half centimeters, so we should ask SVS, why did we wait? <laughs> And uh, it, the, the risk is truly, you know, until that happened, you know, you hear it, you read this, et cetera, that's a true entity. In pregnant female, females, these aneurysms rupture. And uh, so how do you deal with it with a nine-week-old baby and then you have to now treat the yeah. splenic artery aneurysm on the spot? And then we had another one after that, like, which was 21 weeks, and then came in with an aneurysm pain, uh, it's not, not, not ruptured yet, Literally within two weeks time period, I had to treat two pregnant females mm. with the splenic arteries, one ruptured, one about the rupture. So they're neither one of the most three centimeters. So you, hit, you need to keep your threshold very low in a childbearing age woman, and the rest can be, I mean, it's controversial to kind of discuss. I think patient input is very important. Mm. Yeah. Next year, you're going to have to present those cases here in ISF. Yeah. <laughs> very good. All right, should I get started? Sure. Okay, this is uh, a completely different topic. Uh, common thing, these are my disclosures. And so portal hemodynamics is a different uh, kind of, it's a different circulation than the rest of the body, right? It's like the, uh, an additional venous structure in the organ that normally uh, you don't have with the kidney or any other organ. So it's the most, in my mind, it's the most complicated vascular system. And uh, understanding the balance is the key in managing these patients because we're usually dealing with cirrhotic patients with liver fibrosis, which kind of backflow, portal hypertension, and side effects of that portal hypertension. So there could be like a lot of outflow veins, varices, shunts through esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, and every patient develops a different kind of uh, cholerization pattern, so there's no uniformity. And uh, so you need to consider the patient's liver function, encephalopathy, ascites, bleeding, and also polar wave preservation. If there's any chance these patients are gonna get a transplant, they need a patent portal vein to be able to go through that process. And a transplant is like almost, they're gonna give them a new life. You know, somebody 50 years old with end-stage liver disease, if they get a transplant, they may live another 20, 30 years, Otherwise, they're not going to make it more than a few extra years. So, can, oops. so these are your tools, right? You have coils, plugs, and liquid embolics, uh, pretty much. We don't really use cover stents uh, uh, a lot in the portal circulation. And uh, you need to look at your target vessel and the size. You need to look at your flow direction and flow rate because sometimes, even though it's a venous system, some of these shunts are very fast, etc. cetera, your, your coil may just fly away. And the distance, tortuosity, as well as the technique, uh, you may require balloon occlusion uh, or just deploy a plug if it's a safe area versus coil. I'm gonna start with an interesting case that, which I've never seen personally myself. So this patient's transferred from another hospital to us with massive vertical hemorrhage you know, history of alcoholic cirrhosis, esophageal versus. And at the outside hospital, they tried to the EGD and banding, and, but patient actually went into pulsus arrest, but transfused with the massive transfusion protocol, and they were concerned for esophageal perforation. We didn't get the details, but there's something happened, and it's like, and then they kind of tried to resuscitate the patient and ship it to us, ship them to us. So with massive bleeding, he came in. The hemoglobin at that time was 6.8, and we don't know exactly what happened throughout that time. 
So our, uh, our hepatology team and us were consulted. Hepatologists said, well, they already tried the banding as up, you know, uh, endoscopic approach needs to go straight to TIPS. We said, fine, we always love, you know, uh, TIPS cases. So patient is on the table. The RA pressure is zero, portal pressure is 45. You know, I've seen quite a lot of like gradients, but this was, I think, the worst that I've seen personally. And uh, so, and this is the angiogram right after we got in. We advanced our wire, so this wasn't intentional. We got into that left gastric uh, kind of by accident. It kind of followed the course of the splenic, so I thought I was in the splenic grade. Did a portogram, and we got this picture. Uh, what's interesting in this picture is you can see the esophagus. Uh, with contrast from gastric varices. You know, uh, up to this time, I've seen a lot of patients bleeding from their mouths with the tubes in the Blackmore uh, balloons, etc. but I have never seen an active hemorrhage uh, into the esophagus, so this, this case is the only one that I've seen that. So what do you do right now? As you're in there, patient's actively bleeding, and it's like you can't see bleeding coming out of the mouth too. By that time, my shoes were all kind of changing color. It's, it's a quite nervous scenario. Any, uh, any input? Yeah, I mean, I, look, I mean, typically our approach has always been to place the tips and then, you know, in a case like this, embolize. But I think in this case, uh, you're right there. I think I'd be, a you know, patient is, you know, bleeding in front of you. I would, I would try to shut this down immediately. Exactly. And then usually you just do mechanical embolization in these cases, you know. But since this was an active hemorrhage and I didn't know how much other varices were connected, potentially from splenic gastric into this, this is a network, right, in the venous system. So I wanted to just kind of sclerose this thing first, which I don't normally do unless it's like a BR2 kind of an approach. And uh, we used, and it didn't take a lot of time. We used a little bit of soot radical, mixed it with air, etc. You can see the kind of artifact from that uh, sclerosis. And, but the way that we did that is we changed our catheter into a balloon catheter. So we kept occlusion throughout the procedure. We never let the blood flow to that area. So Fogger to balloon catheter immediately, stopped the flow. Uh, through that, we get, put a microcatheter and then did the sclerosis. And after that, we started coiling it kind of backwards, that left gastric inflow. And it was a complete stop of the blood flow. And then we went to the actual splenic wing. So, so let, let me ask you about that. Do you have a specific ratio of the foam that you're creating? Uh, I usually, I know people do different things. I do two, two, two. It's a lot easier for my residents to, and pretty much everything you do is gonna work. It's not a big deal. So, 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 so two of sotradecol, two of contrast, two of air? Correct, yeah. And then you aggressively kind of mix up. You have to keep mixing it because if you let it sit somewhere, it's just gonna separate again. Yeah. And, uh, and I use the usually like a three cc syringe. Uh, and then to inject them. And uh, so we did this, uh, you know, we placed the tips right after that immediately and did our program. Could you play that again, please? So there was a, the reason that I did that is a lot of people kind of miss that. You have to be at the hilum of the spleen when you're doing your final uh, angiogram and these things because uh, if there are any residual varices, et cetera, uh, if you don't treat them and patient has a mechanical rupture, may continue to bleed. So I always check what I'm dealing with, like going into the SMV as well as the splenic vein uh, more distally to make sure that you're seeing the whole anatomy in these patients. So right after this, interestingly enough, uh, after putting the tips, the protostemic gradient went down to three. And, you know, I, I place the tips and balloon the tan. Normally, I use constraint tips a lot of the times. In this case, I didn't think it was going to be a problem. So we went ahead and uh, just balloon to tan because he's bleeding. And so you're not going to be worried about encephalopathy. But uh, this comes in, and then we see what happens, and the patient's liver function starts to deteriorate. And uh, it's becoming like the difficult to kind of bring back out of the anesthesia, et cetera. So we brought the patient back and then we constrained the tips using, we always like to use this technique. I know there's a lot of ways people have described how to lower the kind of the uh, gradient across the tips. 
Uh, I like to use the cover stent and uh, open up distally and then open up proximally and then the center you can just kind of gradually dilate starting with five millimeter balloon, check the gradient, six millimeter balloon as needed and then once you get to an ideal gradient, you stop. So this is kind of as you can see, the large sheet is pulled back over there after uh, dilating the distal part and then the proximal part is uh, dilated and then now you have a narrow tips and the gradient went up to, I think, 11, if I remember correctly. Yep, and then that's kind of a good gradient for patients who are having encephalopathy or uh, liver function problems. So, so if you go back to your previous slide, um, so you, you, I see that you're using, co you know, a covered stent there, an atrium stent. In order to uh, deploy the distal part of that stent, you're only partially removing, pulling back your sheath, and you're, you're going in, you're going in, uh, you're basically blowing up your balloon there. Correct. I choose a re the longest available stand and then pull the sheath about two centimeters from the distal end, keep the rest constrained within the sheath, and then uh, inflate the balloon so the distal part opens up. And then I pull the sheath back. And then uh, in the old time, we had the, the, the longest atrium stand was only nine millimeter. So your tips is 10. So there was a lot of movement, so you have to kind of use the sheath to keep things in place or around. Now you can use other kind of gore started yes. having like 10 millimeter long ones. Oh. So you can just start with that one and not worry about it. It's gonna start from the beginning. Yeah, one of our concerns always there was, you know, displacing the balloon from the stand, but yeah. I think it's an elegant solution to do it inside the sheath. Yeah. yeah, you have to use your sheath to control the balloon and the stand, otherwise things may move though. But it, that whole thing takes 15 minutes. It's like, I think it's the easiest way to reduce the shunt. Yeah. We used to do it differently before the, you know, uh, different than this technique. Um, in the old days, we used to do like two stents, you know, parallel stents, and we call one of them, or we use a shorter stent and a longer stent to cover that, so it's like constricting it. But with this, the, the technique that uh, Bullant actually described is, is very innovative, and um, I think all of us move towards it because it takes exactly 10 minutes, you know. Uh, you deploy the, you know, inflate uh, the balloon, you deploy the first one. It's just, the one thing I would just like to mention here is that the, the, the sheath that you use is very important because remember that when you inflate the balloon, it's going to expand inside the sheath as well. So if you use a really big sheath, then you're, you know, you, you're going to, you won't have a control over the restrained part of the stand. So yeah. ten, 10 French, I think, is what we Excellent point. 10 or 12 yeah. French, I mean, it's like, the 12th bridge is going to, inside the 12th branch, you're going to have only three, four millimeter expansion. And then that'll allow you to pull the balloon back easier. Because otherwise, if you use a really small sheath, the problem will be you are going to try to pull the sheath back when you're trying to pull the balloon. The narrow area over there is going to pull the whole stent back. So a little space is good, not too much, though. That's a good tip. Yeah. So this is, you know, pre and post. And patient actually uh, remained as a for, for a little bit, but then it started to improve. Liver functions began to normalize. He had no further bleeding episodes. And uh, this is another case. Uh, so gastric varices can happen either through the left gastric, is that right, esophagus, uh, involving the left side of the stomach, or it can happen through the splenorenal shunt, splenogastrorenal shunt. And then uh, that's the most common way. I think this technique, uh, uh, BRTO technique, has been described in, uh, in Europe, I mean, I'm sorry, in Asia, uh, well ahead of us. It's been a common way to manage encephalopathy as well as gastric bleeding uh, in Asia for a long time. Uh, to the US, I think there were a couple cases, but US was more tips oriented for management of the bleeding. And uh, for encephalopathy, actually, we didn't do anything. And most patients, in, even in my current practice, uh, I started 10 years ago. It took me five years to get my hepatologist to understand how BRTO works, how it's helpful, et cetera. Now they ask me to do it on everybody. Mm. It's like, uh, so you may have to train your kind of transplant team in this thing. So, oops, went too fast. Can we go back one, please? So this is a patient, this is the BRTO case, to embolize the gastric varices. Again, uh, this uh, one issue with that one is, everyone has a different size of a splenorenal shunt, or splenogastrorenal shunt. And uh, if you can see this one, this balloon is a relatively large balloon. It's a 12 French sheath. And uh, the first time that it was described, 
you just put a balloon and then you get your mixture of whatever embolization kind of mixture you want to do. So radical again, two, 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 with alcohol, uh, you can use alcohol. There's a different one in the alcohol would be very corrosive and painful. So sotradical is a better one. And, but people have used gel foams, lipidol, et cetera, different comp you know, combinations have been described. So when we first did this one in the US in 2006, actually one of my old fellows, he became an attending, Warren Sabi, he came up with this. The patient wasn't a candidate for tips, but was bleeding. He read this article from Asia that they have done like hundreds of patients. He goes like, you know, can we do this? I go like, why not? It's like, and then he did the first case over there. Nobody knows his name, but he's the one who was actually ahead of all these publications that came from UVA. And uh, so then we started doing it regularly. We used to put the balloon up there, inject the sclerosis, and the patient would go up to ICU 24 hours. And then the next day, we would just gently deflate the balloon. Everything is thrown, both flooding. And we would pray and then take things out. That was the technique. But that has changed since then. You know, now we have uh, the parto, carto, and everyone comes with these names, which is kind of uh, interesting. But uh, they actually make sense. Carto is coil assisted uh, occlusion, and then parto is plug assisted. And we essentially switch to parto in most cases. But carto is also very helpful and useful, and uh, because you can do everything through one catheter, you can inject your sclerosant and uh, with the balloon occlusion. After you inject your sclerosin, you have one excess, and then you get a microcatheter through that same balloon while the balloon is up. If you have long, large coils that can go through a microcatheter, you can just start packing it in there, and you establish your occlusion on the table. And after you do this, and you take everything out and just slowly deflate the balloon. Oops. Can we go back, please? One. You just deflate the balloon and uh, kind of check, make sure that nothing is moving, and finish the procedure on the table. So, and uh, I think we had, can you go back one more, please? I had, I thought I had one image that showed the gastric versus in this patient that was kind of a problem and bleeding. So one of the important things is you put your balloon up, you initially inject contrast, you can actually look at the volume with contrast injection that's required to reach the gastric varices, and you try to make same amount of sclerosing agent to do that and then to reach those gastric varices. Because if you do less than required amount, even though you may occlude the shunt, the varices will stay there and they'll find different pathways. Do you have a preferred embolic agent uh, when you're doing either parto or carto? Uh, again, the two to two, so radical. I sometimes put a little bit of lipidol in it, but it's expensive. So if I really want to see where the things are going and staying, I do that rarely. And uh, sometimes I mix gel foam too. That's so like, that's what I, there's using. no science to it, okay? Yeah. There's no publication. You just kind of get stuff in there that's gonna kind of clot off the things. Yeah, we've been using a gel foam slurry, yeah. but yeah, a lot of different approaches here. Yeah, we Are you doing anything differently? No, it's, uh, it's the same. We just add sometimes the pyrol just to see it very well if you're trying to really reach the nidus. I treat those like AVMs, you know, so you really have to fill the nidus and, you know, just to prevent the uh, recruitment from other, you know, uh, uh, veins. And uh, what I was trying to say is there is also avatine that some people use, which is also an embolic agent. It's just like um, close to the gel form, you know. So, um, yeah, but there is a lot of cocktails that people mix. Do you, how, what, how do you determine your endpoint? Because sometimes I think it could be hard to you know, kind of see the spillage back into the portal. Yes. Uh, are you utilizing cone beam? You're utilizing any other advanced tools? Or you just keep on injecting until hopefully you start to see some of that portal inflow? I just keep on injecting. And then it's like, and uh, usually like if you inject sclerosin and it's not flowing away, and then you start kind of constant persistence of the sclerosin in the splenorenal gastric areas. I usually try to reflex up to the gastric if I can. And once you see that in fluoro, you know, again, we started with 24 hour balloon occlusion. We went down to four hours. We went down to two hours. And then like, this is over the course yeah. of like almost 10 years. And then now we started kind of using these and then slowly deflating the balloon. I still don't do that very fast because there are some chance the flow is so fast, et cetera. Uh, there's definitely failure, so it's not going to work on everybody. You just want to make sure 
uh, things that you're putting there won't migrate. So being a little patient and a little bit cautious, especially at the time of deflating that balloon, you don't want to see any movement. And if you're kind of stable only with your contrast, and you want to have that contrast stay there. You don't want to kind of deflate the balloon on the table on the day one. The day two, it may be gone if you were waiting, but then it's mute. On, if you're doing on table procedure, you want to have enough contrast and you want to keep an eye on it. Do it slowly, think stable, and then you can take it down. Very I'm good. sorry, I have a question. Do you keep the balloon then for hours or no? Do you just take no, it out just, if you're doing just throughout the procedure. Oh, okay. Yeah. Exactly. Once I see this picture, for example, then I do you know, the coil assisted one and uh, pack my coils to the degree that I'm kind of satisfied. And then I slowly deflate the balloon and make sure okay. that the contrast is not moving and take it out. If you're doing plug assisted, you don't have that option. But uh, then you kind of deploy a large plug in there. You usually need two access for that one. You can't do it with a single access, which is not a big deal in the Venus system. So you just deploy the plug and you have your microcatheter above that level and you start in injecting sclerosin. And initially some of them may go through the plug, but it, it occludes quite fast. In the next five, 10 minutes, it's just gonna start kind of building up there and you'll be done. Excellent. But for the sake of time, uh, we're gonna go to uh, last, but not last, not least, uh, Dr. Salazar is gonna be presenting on pelvic venous insufficiency. So I have one comment. I thought we were the first ones to do that technique, but this was 2008 in the BI, because we have a fellow from South Korea, mm -hmm. but you beat us, 2006. <laughs> so just yeah, going back to the historical it, it wasn't background. Me. My fellow was Asian origin too, but he was born here. <laughs> We're going to switch gears now to present a pelvic venous insufficiency, and, and these are my disclosures. Thank you so much for having me. This is my first in-person conference, so I'm very happy to be here. And for when we talk about pelvic venous disorders, there's definitely a spectrum. There's no one size fits all. And today I'm going to present to you different applications of embolic agents in different clinical situations. This is a little bit of a summary of how I do my workup for those patients. They're all having chronic pelvic pain, but there's different uh, reasons for why. Um, usually we have a classic presentation of multiparous women. They present with uh, reflux in the ovarian veins. Uh, but there's also a subset of women that I find in my practice that have compression syndromes with uh, left iliac vein stenosis and also um, left uh, renal vein and left iliac vein stenosis. So these require a little bit more of workup as, um, with cross-sectional imaging. And then last but not the least, I do also treat a lot of vein patients, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can discover or can have those patients in the clinic when they have non saphenous uh, veins um, in the legs. So let's just get started with the, the brief workup. It's very important to rule out other conditions that can overlap and cause chronic pelvic pain. So most of the time I will have the patient already being ruled out for all those, all those sort of other pelvic conditions. My imaging usually um, requires a, a transvaginal ultrasound. If I see there's pelvic varices and cross pelvic uterine vessels larger than uh, eight millimeters, then I don't order anything else unless the patient has renal pain or leg symptoms, in which case I would order a cross-sectional imaging. It can be a CT or MRV. And in terms of my checklist, I think one of the very important things about the clinical history on those patients is what I call the three Ps, where patients have chronic pelvic pain that is postural in, 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 in in characteristic, meaning that it's worse when they're standing and they, uh, when they lay flat, uh, they actually have relief of the pain. Um, and also very important that uh, postcoital pain that persists for a couple of hours, quite significant. So in terms of the, oh, can you go back one, please? In terms of the guidelines, um, these uh, are the Society of uh, Vascular Surgery guidelines. And in terms of embolic materials, we basically can coil, can plug, or can do sclerosant for these conditions. And this is for the ovarian, the internal iliac veins. This is the most of literature of what we have, and there's a lot of heterogeneity in the data. Uh, I don't think this is plain. So I'm going to show, and one of the most important things is, um, let me just see if this plays. Okay. One of the most important things when treating those patients, again, we're in the elective setting, so is to avoid coil migration. And this has been described early on in the experience in this, in this pelvic, condition, uh, pelvic disorder, uh, particularly if you're using to embolize the internal iliac veins. Now, we do have a current uh, data uh, from last year from the Gregorio and where they embolized four uh, vessels like internal iliac and ovarian veins, and they also had migration of plugs and co uh, of coils and uh, particularly when uh, the internal iliac vein was embolized. So, uh, and that was about 2%. 
So that's very important. And again, this is what we've known from the literature. We have a lot of different approaches. We moved from uh, doing just left ovarian vein embolization to then finalizing with four vessel sort of embolization uh, most recently. And this meta-analysis summarizes what I tell my patients and what I usually use in my practice, whereby regardless of the variation in technique, there is about 75% uh, substantial pain relief, although there's no high quality data. And it's important to know that historically, one third of those cases were bilateral embolization with coil being the dominant technique. So we were not using sclerosins a lot. Now, this is a patient of mine that presented five years ago, 31 year old, with significant pelvic pain. And this is the worst case scenario in terms of large vessel territory. At that time, I did not have uh, high, uh, sort of large coils. And I basically ended up uh, embolizing with everything that I had in my, uh, in my, in, in my inventory. So coils, sotrodecal and gel phone, and you can see the final result. And I have to say, this was a long case because of the, the level of uh, sort of uh, vessels. And she's doing well uh, five years later with zero pain in the pelvis. Now, another patient here, and I just want to point out, because of the heterogeneity of presentation in clinical presentation and anatomical presentation, we now have what we call the SVP classification, which hopefully is going to basically standardize at least the, the, the workup of those patients and have us understand better which conditions improve the best. So this is a patient with what I call the classic presentation, bilateral ovarian vein reflux, significant uh, 3P pain. Um, and she didn't have any obstruction. She didn't have any history that would uh, uh, sort of suggest to me obstruction. And throughout the years that I've been doing this, I switched from femoral to juggler approach when it comes to the ovarian veins. I just think it's a more straightforward approach. I use a six French uh, long enso sheath, and then I just cut the rise of the renal vein, confirm my reflux, and then I go ahead and do embolization. Now, the one thing that is really important to understand, and I think we don't know yet what the, the jury is still out for this, is what to do with the pelvic varices. And I think similar to What's presented before in terms of the gastric virus is no brainer. You have to embolize everything distal and then coil uh, proximally. Here we have a little bit of variation and my approach is to treat the pelvic reservoir. And usually my approach is with 3% uh, uh, sotradeco, a one to four foam mixture. So I just measure the amount of contrast and then I go for that. But you can just use anything. You can use uh, sodium morate, uh, polydocanol, gelfam slurry, et cetera. And then once I treat that, then there's many different ways that you can treat the ovarian vein, and there's many different embolic agents. So uh, my favorite approach is the sandwich technique, whereby you, you mix uh, the sotradecol and then you do coil embolization. And towards the end, as you can see here, I use usually a detachable coil. In this case, I use a concerto coil through a microcatheter to finalize my occlusion up to two centimeters from the renal vein origin. And uh, that's my preferred approach. So we did that. This is the patient. Um, and she, at two years follow-up, was asymptomatic. So this was a, a good sort of result, like 100% improvement, but it's not always like that. And one always wonder about what else we are missing. So now, what about patients with leg symptoms that present to your practice and also have pelvic pain? This is data from Kathy Gibson and showing the differences in presentation. So pa patients who have leg varices from pelvic origin, they're present at younger ages as compared to patients with varicose veins from saphenous origin. And they're also uh, skinner, like they have like less BMI. And that's usually what I observe in my practice. So this is one of such patients that presented to me with a non-saphenous um, leg uh, pain or leg veins in the left leg. And when I asked about pelvic congestion, pelvic uh, venous disorder, she did have the three Ps and we decided to order an MRV and, and look for different things. So this is her venography. She does not have gonadal vein reflux. She does have bilateral internal iliac reflux with uh, significant collaterals and pelvic varices. So my approach to that was to treat with a balloon occlusion catheters and the internal iliac with 3% sotradecol. And you can see here the gluteal point or the gluteal vein here, which I think is the point of scape for her in the posterior thigh where the vein that she had. So we treated that and she did very well. And my last case is what we're talking about, about what else can you use for a large vessel territory. And, you know, Medtronic had uh, recently uh, released the VersaCoil, which is a large coil. 
and it can go through either for French or microcatheter system. And here we're embolizing a different patient where uh, she has a large gonadal vein and we could not use sclerosins. As you can see, I already treated her on the left side and she developed sclerosant uh, uh, sort of allergy, significant allergy. So for my second case, I couldn't do the sclerosin and I didn't want it to because she had significant uh, allergic reaction. So I only was left with coils. And in these situations, you have large vessel, you have to occlude to be, to be uh, successful with your endpoint. And the Versa coils are nice because they come in long lens. As you can see here, uh, me, my fellows, um, uh, doing the, do you see the long sort of like um, delivery system. And you have to be careful because you're deploying these coils as you're as you're advancing the coil, because the coil is still in the container and you're still advanced. So I'm, I'm looking at the deployment. And the one thing that is important also to know is that there's a one-on-one -on -one sizing. So traditionally with the ovarian veins, we have always thought uh, our fellows like, let's oversize for a little, like a 20%. For this one, you don't really need to, and you have nice occlusion at the end. So just to want to make sure that I prove that the fellows do help us to learn a little bit of innovation. In this particular case, uh, you know, we're doing it together and it's, it's, it's a very nice sort of outcome with those large coils. So as um, summary, uh, we do have different presentations on this condition, but proper diagnosis and patient selection is key. Um, and that's why I show sort of how I do a differently uh, workup depending on the patient's symptoms. Regardless of the heterogeneity of data, ovarian vein and internal iliac vein embolizations yield a 75% positive clinical response to treatment. And of course, this is based on the systematic review. But quite frankly, if those patients are offered hysterectomy, I'll take the 75% improvement any day, uh, particularly for women that do not want to have uh, the uterus removed. In terms of embolics, um, so my approach is treat the pelvic reservoir with liquids my preferred is 3% sotodecol in foam. And the ovarian veins, usually transjugular approach with sandwich technique. The approach for internal iliac veins, although has been reported that plugs and coils also do help, I always use balloon occlusion sclerotherapy. I think it's less complications and it's good results. And last but not the least is the territory for large vessel, large coils, long lens, particularly if the ovarian vein is more than 12 millimeter, it's really helpful. Thank you very much, and I'll take some questions. Okay. It's, a great, it's a great overview uh, for pelvic venous disease. Obviously, it's a very complex topic. Um, you mentioned your different approaches. I know there's one uh, recent paper which talked about, talked about embolizing you know, both the ovarian veins as well as the hypogastric veins. What's your approach? Do you go after all four? So I don't, and I don't know, again, it's the data is like the guidelines, right? Like we, 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 I know that, that that paper showed very good results in the four vessel. Um, I usually don't. Um, I think what's important is uh, to sort of differentiate the symptoms. Sometimes those patients have symptoms on the left side only. Uh, I have seen recurrences, that said, I have seen patients that I embolize the left ovarian vein and they became pregnant and then they come back with the right ovarian vein. That's for sure. Um, for me, I, 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 less is, is more, you know, but I do think there is, there is a, you know, we should interrogate all of the four vessel territory and at least similar to uh, diagnosing compression syndromes, you know, sometimes you're not even thinking and then you should interrogate at least, you know, if you, if you go for a procedure for a patient who has pelvic pain and you're going only by the transvaginal ultrasound, you should definitely interrogate whether a patient has iliac vein stenosis or renal vein stenosis, although the history is gonna tell you a little bit about it. Okay, in terms of your uh, technique for creating a foam for you know, hypogastric embolization, for example, can you go through that again? Yeah, so I, I guess I'm like, <laughs> like I, I have my own recipe and I never change, and that's a problem sometimes, we just continue. So my, my recipe is one to four, so one uh, cc of sotradecol, to four parts of air, and I use the Tessari method, the same thing that we use for the superficial varices in the leg. And what I do is that I don't mix with any contrast, and I don't use a balloon, so you know, I go very distal, and I just measure the amount of contrast that I uh, use to fill the pelvic reservoir. So usually it's about five, seven cc's, and then I let the contrast seats there, and then I'll let the foam flow uh, through a microcatheter, most likely, and then just you can see the column of contrast moving with the foam taking place into those veins. So that, that's for the reservoir. Now for the internal iliacs, I use balloon occlusion, and I keep the balloons inflated for uh, five minutes. For five minutes? Yeah, and there's no science behind that. 
in that case that you showed, Dr. Arslan, with the uh, uh, with the gastric variceal or esophageal bleeding, how how long did you leave that uh, fogardia for? Well, I I actually follow it with a coil, almost always. I never deflate the balloon. I do the same thing in the very main. I use a microcatheter to do the sclerosis while the fogardia balloon is up, and then after I sclerose everything to kind of like to the degree that I like it then I just use uh, coils through that same system without deflating the balloon. So, I mean, a little sugaridical can mix with systemic circulation. We use it all the time. It's not the end of the world. But if it's too much, if the clots start migrating, it worries me. I don't know if it's happening or not, but I just don't want to find out. And then I pack it with coil, and I'm done. I take everything out. I do the same thing for the pelvic embolization, pelvic uh, vein embolization as well, you know, with the fulgur tune. I do the internal elect. So uh, my question, I guess, uh, to you, Gloria, do you um, do the sandwich technique for the ovarian veins in specific, which is like putting a coil and then sclerose and then a coil at the top? So as you can see, I don't use a balloon for the ovarian vein. Mm -hmm. um, and so that limits a little bit on the third or the proximal part of the ovarian vein. Mm -hmm. So I do the sandwich all the way to distal, and then I coil up with a large coil, like all the way up, okay. and I yeah. just pack it. I mean, I think my experience with the balloon, I think it's a great technique, and, it, and a lot of people use it. I just experienced, and maybe it's just me, a lot of spasm, which I think it's okay, but if you're trying to, if you have a lot of collaterals, a lot of duplicated, sort of duplication, et cetera, it's just hard to get distally once you, once you, and we can always blame it on the fellows, but you know, it's not <laughs> quite the case usually with the balloons, but I think it's a great technique, and a lot of uh, operators, interventional radiologists use it. But you prefer to just coil the whole, the whole. Uh, no, no, I do the sandwich technique. I do the foam all the way mid, mid level to the ovarian, then I coil up, like okay. because then I'm not using a balloon, so it yeah. could reflux into the the, the systemic um, circulation. Well, look, I want to thank uh, the panel for this great discussion. Thank you for attending. Um, I want to thank Medtronic for sponsoring this session. Uh, the main session is going to be starting at 7.20 in the morning. Uh, I think there's also another industry-sponsored session uh, tomorrow morning as well. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.